direct talk. And I, I've done three of them now, one on Tao, one on fasting, and one on Sabbath. And I have a fourth one. This week, though, my direct talk is about the Sabbath. And if you remember, the point of the direct talk series about things that Jesus said is that sometimes the church has glossed over some of the things Jesus said. Or sometimes the church has not looked in depth at some of the things Jesus said as it pertains to, as we turned out and found out with doubt and with fasting, very important things we've been looking over and not looking at deeply enough. And so I want to talk about some of the things about the Sabbath that Jesus said. You know, maybe remember the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Anyone remember that story? Five, five loaves of bread, two fishes, Amen. a little boy. That's all it took for Jesus to feed 5,000 people. Now, the Bible says he fell, fed 5,000 men, but there would have been women too. Okay? So it was probably more than 5,000, and there would have been children too. So Jesus did this like great miracle. With five small, it says small, barley loaves and two fishes. And, and if that wasn't enough, feeding 5,000 people would, would, I think we're going to be okay for potluck. You know, I mean, that's the way you had to do a potluck, right? And if that wasn't enough, immediately after that, the disciples got into a boat and left for the other side of the sea, and Jesus followed them, but not in the boat. I mean, it, these two miracles happen right after each other. Okay, so, so the next morning, they're all over on the other side. The disciples came on the boat. Jesus met them halfway on the water. And, and then the people who they left over there, who got the fishes and the loaves, they really liked it. So, so, so they spent the morning walking around the bay, coming up and meeting with Jesus. And... And they're, Jesus is like, oh, you guys want some more fish and bread? I know. <laughs> and, and they say something interesting to Jesus. They say, they say, how do we know who you are? They say, show us a sign like Moses showed us. Show us a sign. Like Moses had this great sign, and we knew he was from God because he made manna or sweetened bread fall down from heaven. Show us a sign like that. Now, this is after he just fed 5,000 people with what? Five loaves of bread and two fishes and walked across the ocean or the sea. And then they're like, show us a sign like Moses. Moses would be like, let me have the power to do what you do, Jesus. But they're like, show me a sign like Moses. This is what Jesus says to them in John 6. Jesus says to them in John 6, he says, no, no, no. I don't make it rain bread. I don't make it rain manna. I don't make it rain food. I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go Hungry. What's Jesus talking about? He's talking about the fact that Moses led Israel out of captivity. He led them out of slavery. Now, if we think about the Sabbath in this context, we know that the Sabbath was there before Egypt, right? We know that the Sabbath was there all the way back on the what? Seventh day. The Sabbath is a memorial of the seventh day of creation. And we know that Abraham kept the Sabbath. We, we know that the Sabbath was kept by the patriarchs. And we know that when they went into captivity, what did Egypt make them into? Slaves. Workers. It got so bad that right before Moses, the Pharaoh was saying to them, I want double the bricks with half the straw. You know, so they, they were being worked to 
death. Now, when Moses leads them out, what is Moses' excuse for taking them out of Egypt? What does Moses tell Pharaoh? We got any good Bible, Old Testament people here? What does Moses ask for? What does Moses say is the reason he wants to lead the people out of Egypt? So that they can worship. You know why they weren't worshiping God in Egypt? They were slaves. And they were worked 24-7. They were worked to death. So one of the first things Moses does is tell them about the plan of God that they would always have a Sabbath and no one would ever be able to work them to death again. So God, you know the story. You know, I know I'm talking to, 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 to people who know the story. Six days it ran, rained manna. Six days. But, and, and every night when the manna came down, he would only stay overnight for one day. Okay? He would only stay overnight for one day. And, and if you tried to keep it any longer than one day, what would happen to it? It would spoil. Amen. And so what would happen is they would only collect enough of the manna for one day. Except for on Friday. On Friday, they had to collect the manna twice, and, or twice as much, because no manna came on Sabbath. So if no manna came on Sabbath, and you didn't collect twice as much on Friday, what happened? What happened? You were hungry, right? You didn't have any food on Sabbath. And so what they would do is they would just have to collect enough to do them overnight. And this was a tremendous miracle which reinstituted the idea of the Sabbath with the Jews. So the Sabbath became this day where you didn't have to work anymore. The Sabbath became this day after coming out of Egypt where they had to make twice as many bricks with twice as less straw, where they were worked 24-7, the Sabbath became this day, this time, this, this, this situation where finally being worked to death was never going to happen again. In fact, Moses went on to make more um, institutions to say, like, not only do they get to rest any, every seven days, but if anyone owes anyone a debt, and they are working to pay that debt off after seven years on the year of Jubilee, the debt would be considered paid. It didn't matter if it was really paid or not. Like, anyone like that kind of deal with your credit card? <laughs> and you know, the thing is, it didn't matter when you incurred the debt in that seven year cycle. You know, it could be like year six, but on year seven, it was gone. God was instituting things that were making sure that never again would Israel be worked to death. God was instituting the Sabbath to be a time of restoration, a time of rest, because Jesus is our restoration. And Jesus did seven particular miracles all on Sabbath. Now, if we looked at the miracles of Jesus, we would find out that Jesus did most of his miracles on non-Sabbath days. Most of Jesus' miracles were not done on Sabbath. But seven Sabbaths in his life, he did a miracle. And it's interesting to me that seven years for Jubilee, seven days in the week for Sabbath, and in Jesus' life, what? Seven miracles on Sabbath. And you think about them. I already preached about one. I preached about the, the pool of Bethesda this year, right? 
That was the first miracle Jesus did on Sabbath. Remember, they got, the Pharisees got all upset. Why are you picking up your bed on the Sabbath? It's unlawful to do this on the Sabbath. Remember that? And, and, and then Jesus cast a demon out of a man who was in the synagogue. And the demon's like, Jesus, what are you doing here already? It's not my time. In the synagogue. That was Sabbath. Jesus cast him out. Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law on the Sabbath day. You know why? Family is important on Sabbath. Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law on Sabbath day. Jesus healed the man with the deformed hand that you find about in Mark 3. That was also a Sabbath miracle. Jesus healed the blind man who had been blind from birth. Remember this story? Like, it's kind of a gross story, Because right? <laughs> you remember how it goes, right? You know, it's kind of like Jesus was playing baseball, you know, spitting on the hands. You know, that's what the baseball pitchers do, right? He spit on the hands, he picked up some mud, and he rubbed this mud into this guy's eyes. And the man was able to see. That was also a Sabbath miracle. And this woman, think about this. This woman, for 18 years, was crippled. For 18 years, she was crippled and bent over. For 18 years, she suffered. And Jesus saw her on a Sabbath day. And, and Jesus said on a Sabbath day, I will not wait one more day to heal this woman. I will not wait until the sun sets. I will not wait until the end of Sabbath because this woman has already waited eight years. She should not suffer any longer. And then there was the man with dropsy. Now that's, that's a term, that's a medical term that we don't use anymore. It's, it's, it's an old, old biblical term, but it just means inflammation, water on either the lungs or on the bowels. It basically means that you're bloating because of organ failure. And right there in Mark 3 is the last miracle Jesus does on Sabbath. Now, if you think about these three or these seven miracles that Jesus did on Sabbath, any one of them could have waited till the next day. Couldn't they? In fact, most of Jesus' miracles weren't on Sabbath. But when it came to suffering, when it came to being oppressed, when it came to hurt, Jesus said, I must make these people whole. I must heal these people. And if we think about all seven miracles, they were done to reduce or to stop suffering. Jesus was making a point that we ought not miss, miss today. Jesus was making a point. Sabbath is great, but Sabbath is not a day for suffering. Sabbath is not a day for hurting. Sabbath is not a day to, to, to just, like, I have to keep it holy, so, so, so you know, I, I'm not going to do anything that, that might be for me. But that's not really how Jesus did Sabbath. That is how some people in the church do Sabbath. You know, it's like you can sin all week but be pious on the seventh. Watch anything on your television on any day of the week. No matter the rating, no matter the language, no matter what's happening, listen to anything you want, but on the seventh day, let's be holy. See, Jesus was different. Jesus was holy every day. But on the Sabbath, he was just himself. Because he didn't need to be more holy. He just needed to be what? Himself. Now, if we practice living like Jesus, if we practice being full of the Holy Spirit, if we practice being good and godly, remember, Jesus did most of his healings, most of his compassions on every other day but Sabbath. 
if we did that six days a week, then on the seventh day, would we be any different? No. But we certainly wouldn't listen to voices that said, on Sabbath, we cannot help this person. On Sabbath, we cannot show compassion. On Sabbath, we must keep ourselves pious. On Sabbath, why don't we have our best clothes on? You know what? Jesus' Sabbath best was his Sunday best and his Monday best and his Tuesday best. There was no elevation of holiness. He was God all the time. Maybe we should be Christians. Then maybe when Sabbath comes, we're just going to be who we have always been. And we're going to treat the day as a special time with God and with each other, but not a time that we're more pious than any other time. A time where we're more sensitive to the needs of others. Time when, because we're closer to God, we act more like God. This is why Jesus said in our last sermon, which was just a few verses ago, in in Mark, I'm going to preach in Mark too, and I was preaching earlier in Mark um, the other day, last week. This is why Jesus said, you know, you don't fast when the bridegroom is there. Remember that. Because when you're close to Jesus, it should be what? A celebration. Now let me ask you something. On Sabbath, isn't it all about dedicating time to be close to Jesus? Close to family? Close to those in need? Close to healing people? Close to loving people? Close to just being in the presence of Jesus together? Like six days a week, like I, I see some of you, but it's only on the seventh day that I see you all together. Right? And so that's what Sabbath becomes. And so that's what Jesus was doing. He was hanging out with his church. He was hanging out with the people that meant something to him. He was hanging out with his family. No, not Mary. No, not his brother James. No, not, not, not any of those people. Not even his brother Jude. No, his family was his church. And he was just hanging out with his family. Now, his, his disciples were hungry because Jesus didn't give them a lot of warning about where they're going to go and what they're going to do. So they're going through this field. And they're doing what? Relieving their own hunger. What did Jesus say? I am the bread of life. And anyone who partakes of me will never what? Hungry, be hungry. So should disciples go hungry because it's Sabbath? Well, they could and then contradict Jesus. But didn't God produce the very wheat and grains that they pick and start eating in that field? And didn't God produce it to be enjoyed? And God didn't God produce it so that they would celebrate? Didn't God produce it to relieve their suffering of hunger even in that moment? And didn't God know that? When he caused those wheat to grow. And then Jesus led them into that field. And one of the things that I've come to understand is Things that are good with Jesus aren't always good with the church. <laughs> you know, it's not always the same because the Pharisees, they see this good thing that, that Jesus is doing with his disciples, just enjoying the things that God has made for them to enjoy. And they're like, oh, can you? I, I knew that Jesus was trouble. Can you see Jesus over there breaking that Sabbath day with, with, with that rowdy group of people? You know, that's what happens when you try to make a disciple out of a tax collector. You know, uh, that's what happens when you take an uneducated fisherman who couldn't even get through the rabbinical school and you make him your head disciple. You see, that's why we are not like Jesus. 
Jesus worried? Jesus knows that the Sabbath is a day of compassion. Jesus knows the Sabbath is a day of relationships. Jesus knows the Sabbath is a day of bonding. Bonding to each other and bonding to God. And so when the Pharisees come and, and they begin to complain to Jesus and they begin to talk to Jesus about what's going on and they're like, what is this guy doing? How can we permit Jesus to, to do this? And the Pharisees say to him, look, why are you doing this thing? Why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Now, it's interesting when we think about how Jesus answers them. It's very interesting because he doesn't even take the bait. And by the way, one of the things we have to stop doing with people is taking the bait. I got to stop doing it. We all got to stop doing it. People are really good at making Christians look foolish by baiting us. Jesus doesn't take the bait. You know why? Because you don't have to take the bait when you know what you're doing is right and you know why. We often take the bait because we haven't thought out what's right. We often take, out the, bait, take the bait because we're not in that Sabbath kind of connection with Jesus. But Jesus has nothing to prove to anyone except for his father. And if his father is good, Jesus knows he is good. And, and so he, he answered and he said, have you never read, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? Now, you know the story from, from the life of David? Jesus is referring to this story when, when David was on the run with his posse, like Jesus is out in the field with his posse. And they were hungry and they had nothing to eat. And, and what happened? Well, let's let Jesus tell us. In the days of Abathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God. Are you listening to what he did? He entered the house of God. David is not a Levite. Only Levites are allowed in the house of God, allowed inside the temple. David entered and he ate the consecrated bread, which only a Levite priest can eat by Mosaic law. The penalty for doing such is death, according to Moses. But David went in. Why? Because his people were hungry. David went in because it was important to relieve people of suffering. David went in and he ate the consecrated bread. Not just him. He gave it to his people. If we read the story in the Old Testament. Which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Jesus doesn't take the bait. But Jesus knows this. He set bait. Because these Pharisees, they're not going to argue with King David. <laughs> these Pharisees, they're going to make all kinds of accusations about Jesus, but they're not going to make accusations about David. And, and, and so David did it. He went into the sanctuary. He went into the place where only a priest can go. And he got the loaves of bread off the table. And he took them out. And he fed them to his people. And then Jesus simply says this. Can we read this one with me? Let's read it all together. Jesus simply says this to the Pharisees. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for who? Man. man, not? Man for the Sabbath. Not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is what? Lord, Lord, of, Lord Sabbath. of what? The Sabbath. Of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is made for who? Yes. Not man for the? Wait, wait, wait. Are we, wait. The Sabbath is made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath. In 
And Jesus says, that is the proof that he is Lord over the Sabbath. Amen. Jesus is saying, the fact that I don't keep Sabbath like you Pharisees, the fact that I don't use Sabbath as an excuse to punish people, the fact that I don't use Sabbath as an excuse to beat people up spiritually, the fact that I don't use the Sabbath as a proof of my piousness, the fact that I don't use Sabbath as a proof that I am the Messiah, the fact that I don't use Sabbath to prove who I am proves who I am. I want us to think about that. You see, because you were not created to serve the Sabbath. You were not created to serve a day. You were created to serve God. Amen. But the Sabbath was created to serve you. Back to merit, back to grace, back to last week, back to fasting. In the same way, it's a violation of the law of God, the spiritual law of God. To gain merit from suffering during fasting. But rather we said fasting is a time to focus in on who Jesus is and get connected to him. So goes the Sabbath. You don't get merit from keeping the Sabbath. If you got merit from keeping the Sabbath, you would be a legalist. Which is what Jesus is accusing the Pharisees of right now. But the Sabbath exists and is holy and is set aside and is consecrated and is forever because it is there forever to serve you. Not to make you give you a space and time to focus on Jesus. To focus on your relationships in your family. To focus on serving your community. What did Jesus do? He healed seven great miracles on Sabbath. What did Jesus do? He got together with people who mattered to him. What did Jesus do? He built relationship with God and each other because that is why the Sabbath is there. I don't know about you, but I know about me. I couldn't believe it was Friday yesterday because time just happens so fast. The Sabbath comes to rescue us from ourselves. The Sabbath comes to rescue us from anything that's oppressing us. Remember, Israel were slaves in Egypt, and the first thing God does when he pulls them out is reinstitute the Sabbath through the manna so that they will stop being slaves and working each other to death just as the Egyptians did. Sabbath is rest from all that would oppress. The Sabbath is rest from all that would oppress. I don't live more pious on the Sabbath. Actually, the Sabbath puts me in connection with God enough that I start living better on all those six other days. The Sabbath is what rescues me from the chaos of my own life. The Sabbath is what rescues me from the chaos of my own schedule. The Sabbath is what rescues me from the expectations that what other people will put on me. More bricks, less straw is what we hear today in our workplaces. 
we might as well be working for Egyptians, folks. <laughs> and I work for you guys, so that's scary, right? <laughs> Some of them catch that. <laughs> the Sabbath comes to rescue us, to refresh us, to reboot us, to rebuild us, to repower us, to refuel us, and to set us free to live better, a better, not just one day, but a better whole week. Because we cleared everything off and got a glimpse of Jesus again that we were going to take with us into the week. Now, I don't know if you heard this story. It's all over the place. It's on USA Today, the newspaper. It's on Fox News. It's on CNN News. It's on everybody. This guy named Yoshi. Yoshi Gallo. He lives in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. His video has gone viral. You, you can all Google it as soon as I'm done. His video has gone viral. He went in. No, he just was walking across the street from McDonald's. I don't even know that he was planning to go there. And he saw a man who was being oppressed. Just like Jesus saw people who were being oppressed. And this guy said, this man should not be oppressed another day. This man deserves to be rescued from what is oppressing him. And this man was homeless and he was hungry. So Yossi said to this man, come with me across the street to McDonald's and I will buy you lunch. Some miracles are easy. The man was very thankful. They went into McDonald's. They ordered two meals, two combo meals. The homeless man was waiting at the seat, and Yoshi brought them back. And this guy, who we won't talk about his name, um, we'll just call him manager, he came out and said, I don't want that homeless guy in my restaurant. Yossi said, he's my guest. He said, no, we don't allow those kind in here because in the past they caused trouble. You see, you buy him a hamburger, but when you go, he's going to stay and harass people. Yossi said, just basically, well, he's not harassing anybody now. We're just eating some burgers. We'll go together. And this manager's like, no, you will take this man out of my restaurant. And Yoshi is like, I paid my money to eat a burger with this man. You can't tell me to leave. This man said, maybe I cannot. But he called this lady. And this is actually her, but we won't use her name either. And this lady came and said, this man has said you're trespassing. The guy's like, how can I be trespassing? All I did was come in here and order two burgers. Isn't that what they're here for? And so then the, the restaurant guy is like, I don't want them here. And then she's like, I got no choice. It's my job. And, and you have to go because he owns this establishment. And he says you have to go. Now, now, in fairness to the lady police officer, she's just doing her job. The problem I have is with McDonald's, not with her so much. But nonetheless, she forces them to leave. And, and Yossi's like, well, she's like, this, he's actually saying some things I'm not going to say in church, but you can catch the video later. Um, Yossi's like, I want my money back. And then the manager is like, no. If you want your money back, take it up with corporate. All Yossi wanted to do was end the suffering of this man. So they both get forced out of separate doors. And then Yoshi yells to the man, where are you going? You got to get out of here. And she's like, come over here to my car. I'm going to take you to a better restaurant. I don't know where they went. 
USA Today says said that they went to a more classy restaurant. And based on what I'm hearing about this McDonald's, that wouldn't be hard. By the way, Yoshi's video, as of Thursday, on his Twitter, had 42 million views. It's been shared a million times. Now it's picked up by Fox News, CNN, USA Today, all the networks. I checked their, you know how I asked you about, say nice things in our reviews? I checked their reviews. They're all down to a one-star restaurant now. Full of nasty things. People are boycotting McDonald's all over the country now. The mayor is standing by the decision. She doesn't understand the boycott's coming to Myrtle Beach. But Yoshi is like Jesus. He doesn't care what people say. He's like, get in my car. I will take you someplace else to relieve your hunger. And according to the reports, he not only did that, for the rest of this week, he's been out with, with this homeless man, taking him from place to place to get him temporary work. You see, that's what Jesus does. That's what the Sabbath is about. Sometimes a Sabbath goes by and Jesus is trying to rescue you from that thing that's oppressing you. Jesus is trying to rescue you from that thing that you can't let go of six days a week. Jesus is trying to rescue you from that thing that you think is so important. Even as you're sitting here listening to me, that's all you can think about. But if he gets kicked out of this Sabbath with you, he'll be back next. And I remember there's this lady who got baptized around the same time I did, and she fell out of the church. And I remember she'd been out for like a year or so, and we went to visit her family, her, her husband, and her two children. Uh, I, I was a brand new Adventist. I was only maybe like in the church for, for not even a couple years. I mean, we got baptized, I think, either the same day or the same, same month, and she just sort of faded out of the church with her family and had this really close friend who was a pastor. And he just asked us to go. And we went and we just visited with them. We just showed up at their house on Sabbath. We're like, hey, we just wanted to visit. We miss you guys. And they're like, come in. And, and, and so we stayed. And they were really glad to see us. It wasn't one of those awkward things. And then the pastor said, well, you know, it's getting close to sunset, which means Sabbath is ending. You know, we don't want to oppose on you guys, but would it be okay if we close Sabbath with you? So I began to pray with them. And now, I'm still a pretty new Adventist. I'm not doing anything smart because I don't know anything smart to do. But we start singing these songs to close the Sabbath. And we'll call her Janice. It isn't her name. Janice just starts crying. pastor asked her, why are you crying? She said, no matter what sins I commit, no matter how far away I am of God, no matter how long it's been since I read my Bible, no matter how long it's been since I've been to church, the Sabbath just comes back to me. I can't hide from it. I mean, everyone knows when it's Friday, and everyone knows when the sun goes down. It's like one of those things. You, you have to put your blinds down and pretend you don't know that it's Sabbath. And I just can't keep running from Jesus because the Sabbath just keeps coming and keep telling me, don't forget about me. Don't forget about me. Don't forget me. You see, Jesus is like Yoshi. If it doesn't stick the first time, he has a plan to get you out of oppression. Jesus comes back another time and another time and another time. And what the Sabbath does is remind us that Jesus wants to call us out of the cycles we're trapped in. Jesus wants to call us out of being a work addict. Jesus wants wants to call us out of being a computer addict. Jesus wants to call us out of being addicted to television all the time and binge watching. Jesus wants to call us out of just over parenting sometimes. Jesus wants to call us out of just what we are into what he wants to make us. You were not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for you. 
You were not made to rescue a day. The day was made to rescue you. The Sabbath is the ever-repeating way that Jesus takes you by the hand and leads you out of your oppression. We've been talking about direct talk. May you start using your Sabbath for, for direct talk with Jesus. You know what I love about the way God made Sabbath? It starts with night. How cool is that? Like every other version of the day starts with day. But it starts with night. Because Jesus knows you're going to be tired. Because Jesus knows the devil's going to run you for six days. And he knows he's going to have to call you out. He's going to have to bandage you up. He's going to have to have you look up at the stars because you can't hide that it's Sabbath. He's going to say, Vinny, 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 talk to me. What's going on? I haven't seen you all week. Oh, yeah, I remember. On your way out the doors, you're grabbing that orange juice. He said, thank you. I appreciated that. That was nice. Oh, yeah, you prayed with Jose because it was supper time, and you put him to bed, but you know, he didn't really have much to say to me, just, you know, make sure Jose did. Oh, yeah, that's right, you prayed at prayer meeting. But you were kind of paid for that one, Vinny. Oh, yeah, 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 you can claim that you prayed every morning in the morning devotions, but hey, I got the same problem with that prayer. Vinny, talk to me. Vinny. Don't forget the Sabbath. Not because the Sabbath is going to save you. Not because you're going to save the Sabbath. But because the Sabbath is this time that I'm pulling you out of your rat race. Directing your attention upward. And whispering my wonderful logos of life. Marvin, lead us. church down in North Carolina in Henderson. Not Hendersonville, Henderson. Just north of Raleigh, if you know it. And we were so small, we were 12 when we started. How cool is that? We couldn't afford hymnals. 
We were so poor when we started, we couldn't afford hymnals. So we had the same opening song and the same closing song every week. <laughs> closing song was always Amazing Grace 108. <laughs> opening song was always Don't Forget the Sabbath 388. And these songs mean so much to me. Are you forgetting the Sabbath? Are you letting the week drag you like an Egyptian slave owner? Are you set free to become a slave all over again? This world will make you build pyramids. This world will make you herd sheep for other people to eat. The Sabbath is there to remind you that no matter what this world is putting you through, there's someone more powerful than this world. And he is going to stop everything for 24 hours for you to taste redemption. For you to taste what it's like not to be a slave to this world. Not to be a slave to the clock. My college professor used to call the clock in our classroom his, en his one-eyed enemy on the wall. Many of us serve that one-eyed enemy. The Sabbath is here to set you free. Today I call you not to forget the Sabbath. Today I call you not to forget the Sabbath because it's not, not, not because it's a work, not because God's going to punish you, not because you're going to get merit from keeping the Sabbath. I call you not to forget the Sabbath because it's God's way of making sure you're not forgot. And that you're not drug into that world to be destroyed. Don't forget the Sabbath. Some of you have never made a commitment to Sabbath. I would invite you to consider doing that today. I would invite you to consider the benefits of stopping one in seven. I would, I would present to you just the psychological benefits, just the physical benefits, just the health benefits. If you're not making a spiritual commitment, that's fine. Just taste it and see what happens. I call you to make a commitment to being a Sabbath keeper because you may have been a Seventh-day Adventist for many years. I heard some people talking this morning in Sabbath school about being Seventh-day Adventist their whole life. Let me tell you, I don't know about them, but I do know some Seventh-day Adventists who have been Seventh-day Adventists their whole life, but I've never seen them keep one Sabbath. Because you can show up at church 45 minutes late and leave 15 minutes early. And you've only shortened your blessing. God still is calling you to a full day in His presence. Where are you in a hurry to go to? If it's not ministered, I say, don't forget the Sabbath. If you need baptism, there's a place on your card for that. If you need profession of faith, there's a place on your card for that. If you want to start Bible studies, I'm starting some Bible studies this week. If, if you need to start Bible studies to get ready for baptism, put that on your card. We would like to help you with that. Marvin, give us one more verse, right? Sing this one. I know you guys know this song. If you don't, I'm going to send you to North Carolina. We'll teach it to you.
us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this is your day. This is your way. These are your people. This is your steeple. Father, what are we doing? What are we doing? Are we making this a priority? Are we committing ourselves to this day? Because this is the way that you're going to keep us committed to you. Father, we're about to go out of here and we're about to go into six days of chaos. Father, I pray that each of these people will read their Bibles during that chaos. Father, I pray that each of these people will pray to you during that chaos. I pray, Father, that each of these people will feel your presence during that, this chaos. I pray that each of these people will live the same way every day, but they will be here every Sabbath to be charged up to the max. Because one thing I know, Father, is leaving your phone battery half full won't get you through the day leaving your soul half empty and not recharging all week won't get you through the week. Father, bring some of them to refresh because they need it. They need it. I don't need it for myself. I need it to stay true to you. They don't need it for themselves. They need it to stay true to you. Keep us submitted to your church. In Jesus' name. Amen. Sing high.